mission, uh, not surprisingly perhaps, uh, is uh, to lead in the development some, of some novel uh, therapeutic strategies towards aging. Um, those of you who follow the aging literature may have noticed that many gerontologists believe that aging is a tumor suppressive mechanism that's been selected for over millions of years of evolution. <clears throat> and so typically what we see is um, a uh, yin and yang between aging and cancer. And indeed we've discovered such yin and yang and, and, and are, it's a part of our focus of our product development of is therapeutics for cancer as well. Now, I'm not going to belabor the aging population. You're all aware of the dynamic that's under, underway in the United States and many other countries. But what I want to point out is that 80% of the healthcare costs are chronic degenerative diseases where the body cannot heal itself. Of course, arthritis, heart failure, and so on. And so <clears throat> we've uh, focused on developing novel therapeutics that directly target degenerative disease. The first that, that was mentioned in the intro was pluripotency-based regenerative medicine. And this is uh, something we began uh, at, at Geron in the spirit of major biotech revolutions. We were looking for a new platform like recombinant DNA that could um, have many applications in medicine and could potentially be by itself the platform uh, a billion dollar industry. Recombinant DNA took some 20 years to mature to a billion dollar industry, uh, but now is of course fundamental. Uh, monoclonal antibodies is a similar platform. Uh, again, it took about 20 years from discovery to billion dollar commercialization. Regenerative medicine, I'm calling it 1.0, which is pluripotent stem cell based, embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. But now in recent years, uh, you're seeing these billion dollar buyouts and uh, large deals. My last company, Lineage, recently announcing a um, 600 plus million dollar deal with Roche, for instance, based on just one product made from pluripotent stem cells. Part of AJAX is the uh, legacy of regenerative medicine for degenerative disease. Um, part is a new platform, which I'm going to introduce you to today. The first platform was making from pluripotent cells, young cells of any kind on an industrial scale made as an off the shelf product. And of course we could make anything in the human body from pluripotent cells, heart muscle, uh, this, this, the product that was recently acquired uh, from lineage was retinal pigment epithelial cells for age-related macular degeneration, but you can potentially make any cell type of the human body from these cells. The new technology, regenerative medicine 2.0, which we're attempting to lead as well, I think is, well, it's the largest um, revolution and biotech, I, I think, that I've ever seen. And that's, um, I call it induced tissue regeneration. Some people call it uh, partial reprogramming. And it's the basis of these recent startups, for instance, with Altos uh, and um, Retro and others raising very significant first rounds of financing. So based on these two platforms, we have three products in development. I'll quickly walk you through them. Uh, brown adipocytes for age-related metabolic imbalance, um, Renalon, which is a product for um, inducing regeneration and reversing the aging of tissues in the human body. We're starting with the skin. And then EPRO, which is this yin and yang, it's a product targeting cancer through a novel uh, mechanism. So, as I mentioned, um, there, there are these billion dollar deals being done now with the pluripotent platform. Vertex bought up two companies, both of which were licensees of my previous company for type one diabetes that is making the beta cell of the pancreas to treat uh, juvenile onset diabetes. Um, we focused instead on type two diabetes at AJAX. Uh, here you can see in the right, the location of brown fat in the upper torso of a human being. 
And here you, in this graph, you can see the age-related loss of brown fat cells. It's thought that these cells and their loss play a significant role in type 2 diabetes and age-related obesity and dyslipidemia. So to think of it very simply, we all know you eat too, too many uh, calories, or fat, or you gain weight, you can get diabetes. Um, exercise reverses that and can reverse diabetes. A cheating way to accomplish the same thing. Some people said it's too easy. The concept is simply uh, to restore uh, this organ's function back to youthful levels. Brown fat burns calories. It generates heat. It uh, pulls the circulation. And uh, animal data suggests that the transplantation of young brown fat cells can uh, reverse type 2 diabetes and cause weight loss. So we see this, you know, it's a 10 times larger market than type 1 diabetes, uh, 10 times more prevalence. And uh, we're quite excited about this product. Uh, without going into a lot of the technical detail, we found a way of making these cells pure and scalable. We call it pure stem. On the left, you can see uh, brown fat cells stained in red, the blue or the nuclei of other kinds of cells. And you can see there's brown fat cells in brown fat tissue sourced from young people, but it's not 100% pure by any means. On the right, as 100% pure, as best as we can determine, young brown adipocytes made using pure stem in our hands from pluripotent stem cells. So we intend to develop this as an off-the-shelf allogeneic product for, the, for transplantation into people with type 2 diabetes and then potentially extending that approval in subsequent years uh, for uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, up to 30 million Americans have diabetes. It's estimated up to half of Americans may have pre-diabetes with the aging of the baby boom population. Um, but it's obviously a very large unmet need uh, in the uh, aging US population. Let me shift now to regenerative medicine 2.0. Um, this is partial reprogramming. We've all heard about it. Uh, Jeff Bezos helped put a lot of money into Altos. Uh, uh, David Sinclair had a masterful work uh, last December on the cover of Nature. Uh, how this technology can induce regeneration and reverse aging in the, in the retina. Um, we have been working, and then there are many other groups, and for those of you who are in those groups or associated with them, forgive me for not naming them all. Um, we've been quite interested in this for some time, and the perspective that we have is, is that the germline is immortal, somatic cells uh, age, from a lack of telomerase, but also they lose regeneration. Animals that retain the regenerative phenotype and never fully mature, as in some of these axolotls, have this absolutely profound capacity for regeneration. Magical, really. Can you imagine inducing this phenotype in a human being to reverse age-related degenerative disease for Parkinson's, for osteoarthritis, for heart failure, um, for the retina, you know, for every tissue in the human body. This is the vision of regenerative medicine 2.0, combined with telomerase, animals that have both phenotypes uh, do not age. Uh, they have no Gompertz curve. And we think this is the most powerful technology ever envisioned for addressing these large markets, but also for um, treating aging. And of course, there's, I think, a growing consensus that this is an important platform. The concept is very simple. Uh, initially, um, some of these factors that can reverse the aging of cells were described as ways to reverse uh, the development, developmental aging of cells back to pluripotency, but their transient expression, we believe, can take cells back in development to when re the regenerative phenotype is present in mammals and in humans. So up to eight weeks of human development, while you're still in this developmental mode where the organogenesis is occurring, tissues can regenerate in humans. 
scarlessly. And the goal is to take uh, a tissue back to that state using transient expression of these factors and variations thereof. Here's a variation thereof. Here we took just two of the factors, one which we discovered COX-71 and one called LEN28. And uh, here's just an example of the induction of profound hair regeneration in a, a mouse model uh, using just those two factors. That's a variation of uh, what's called partial reprogramming that we've uh, been working on and, and filed patents on. Well, the, the concept of induced tissue regeneration, our term for partial reprogramming, uh, is there's, there's an issue. You can, if you overly reprogram cells in a, an attacked mammal, you can take cells back to pluripotency and generate then random tissues uh, in the skin or the heart. And uh, that would be an undesirable outcome. That's there, those are called teratomas. So we've invented a technology we call developmentally regulated ITR, <clears throat> where, for instance, we use this gene I showed you, COX7A1 promoter, to uh, drive the expression of these genes that can take cells back in time and then have it turn off when cells are fully reprogrammed to the regenerative state, but prior to being taken back to pluripotency. We think this is an important invention. We call it DRITR. We plan to implement it uh, along with some of the other technologies, for instance, delivery technologies. I'm just showing you some of them that we've filed patents on, but um, uh, we plan to use uh, a specific delivery modality for this product I call Renalon. Lastly, and racing this very quickly, <clears throat> is the flip side of aging, which is cancer, sort of flip side of the coin. Um, in studying quite carefully using modern molecular techniques, we've uh, dived very deeply into the genome of cells before and after what we call the embryonic fetal transition. The embryonic fetal transition is where regeneration is turned off. Uh, in cells in the human body. Mortality, where cells lose replicative immortality, occurs just in the first couple weeks of development. The embryonic fetal transition is about eight weeks of human development. And we've looked very carefully at the whole genome uh, of human cells as they traverse this EFT to understand the molecular mechanisms that regulate it and to find targets for therapeutic intervention. In doing so, in running lots of controls in our research, we, we uncovered some really interesting biology about cancer. As it turns out, cancer cells um, are generally in the pre-EFT mode. And this is a pan-cancer phenomenon. We see it in colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, glioblastomas, lung cancer, kidney cancer, and so on, lymphomas, so on. And uh, like telomerase, this appears to be a pan-cancer uh, hallmark. And that results in novel therapeutic and diagnostic strategies. And we plan to utilize those in development of a pan-cancer therapeutic, specifically a pan-cancer vaccine strategy. Now, additional thing, which I won't have a whole lot of time to get into, there's a concept out there called cancer stem cells. Some of you may have heard of it. And the thought is, if you have a tumor and you treat it with chemotherapy or radiation, you can wipe out the cancer, but it tends to grow back and it would take just a few seeds to uh, reseed a, a tumor and cause metastasis and so on. Um, these cells tend to then be resistant to chemotherapy or radiation. And so they're thought to be, you know, a stem cell, a more primitive kind of a cell. We think the, um, this uh, notion is uh, incorrect 
and actually uh, backwards. So in, in the analysis we've performed, cancer stem cells are the adult version of a cancer cell and the original uh, cancer is in the uh, embryonic or pre-EFT mode. The novelty of this observation also leads to uh, novel therapeutic strategies and because of its non-obviousness to uh, certain intellectual property, which we plan uh, to commercialize upon. So as an example of our cancer therapeutic, an ambitious new uh, pan-cancer strategy, which we're initially targeting uh, in breast cancer, we call EPRO. It's an embryonic promoter regulated oncolysis. <laughs> Mouthful. So we have everything built into this therapeutic. Cancer-specific targeting and cancer-specific killing and a pan-cancer uh, application. Okay, so how can I justify such a broad statement? Well, first off, the uh, embryonic pre-EFT cells can regenerate because we've discovered they are, uh, these cells are decorated with a complex repertoire of cell adhesion molecules that allow them like Velcro to recognize each other and to build the human body during embryogenesis. These are encoded in the genes called the clustered protocadherin locus. And uh, here I'm showing you the uh, alpha cluster. And these are all either embryonic stem cells here or, or on the left, uh, embryonic progenitor cells uh, that are pre-EFT. And you can see they're expressing these Velcro proteins on their cell surface which allow the body to self-assemble, uh, allows the salamander arm to self-assemble after it was uh, traumatized. Uh, on, uh, to the right of the progenitors in this graph, you can see adult cells do not express these cluster proticoherins. Uh, neuronal cells uh, are known to express them in adult, although at low levels. And then in cancer cells, uh, it's a bit cut off here in this graph, but cancer cells then re-express uh, either members of the alpha or the beta uh, clustered protocadherin locus. So we utilize this because we don't typically have embryonic cells and as an adult, of course, unless you were a female with a pregnancy, um, we use this to uh, decorate our gene therapy vector to target the vector specifically to the tumor cell and then more specificity is um, applied by using uh, genes we've recognized as pan cancer or uh, pan, uh, pan cancer and pan developmental embryonic genes. In this case, CPT1B, it's involved in uh, glucose metabolism to drive a toxic gene product. So this vector is designed to um, adhere specifically to tumor cells in an adult, and then to dr specifically drive a toxic gene product uh, only in the cancer cell. And we call that EPRO or uh, embryonic promoter regulated oncolysis. The early proof of principle that we've shown uh, publicly, again, we're a public company, is simply the use of antibody to the clustered protocadherin genes showing that the antibody itself is, uh, generates a statistically significant loss of breast and in this case, lung cancer cells. Again, we're targeting uh, breast cancer uh, for our product development. So here's the, the pipeline, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the brown adipocytes for type two diabetes. These are young uh, off the shelf allogeneic uh, cells Medicine 2.0, so we're programming Renalon uh, for, uh, we're applying for skin, scarless skin regeneration in uh, typically in geriatric uh, skin ulcers, and then EPRO uh, targeting breast cancer. There's a diagnostic side of this as well, uh, because these genes and their epigenetic marks are, are novel. Uh, we have uh, uh, certain technologies uh, for detecting and or staging cancer uh, based on these novel discoveries. 
Uh, I'm the CEO of the company. Um, we're a, a subsidiary of Juvenescence, uh, which owns about half of our company. Uh, Greg Bailey is the CEO of, of Juvenescence, is on our board. Our chairperson is Joanne Hackett, Michael May at CCRM in Canada. You can find more detailed information about the company online. And as I said, with our filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So we're targeting the largest unmet needs in the aging population. Some 80% of healthcare costs are chronic degenerative diseases of which aging is the lion's share. And uh, our, our focus is, um, as I said, the, these three initial products in preclinical development, brown adipocytes for, uh, for type 2 diabetes, Renalon, which it could be expanded to, I, we think, any tissue in the body for partial reprogramming, but we're initially targeting the skin. And EPRO for cancer, again, uh, broadly applicable, uh, we believe, uh, initially developed for breast cancer. And with that, I'll take any questions.